Chapter Four of Around the Campfire by Charles Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four: More of Camp Desquatu, Part One. On the following morning, we breakfast in a very leisurely fashion, with a delightful sense of having all day before us. We spent the day in casting our flies at the outlet, and our success was a continual repetition of that of the previous night only stranion grew tired he could not hook as many fish as the rest of us wherefore he grew disgusted and chose to sit on the bank deriding us but as long as the fish were feeding we heeded him not our heaviest trout that day just cleared two pounds and a half in the evening we took tea early before settling down we made a little voyage of exploration to the top of a neighboring hill and watched the moon rise over the vast and empty wilderness returning to the camp we doffed our scanty garments ran down the beach and dashed out into the gleaming lake waters it was such a swim as stranion had told us of after this we felt royally luxurious we lolled upon our blankets with a lordly air and the soughing of the pines was all about us for music then in a peremptory tone sam cried stranion sir to you was stranion's polite response stranion continued sam to you it falls to unfold to this appreciative audience the resources of your experience or your imagination i would recommend now a judicious combination of the two thus irresistibly adjured stranion began this is the story of lou's clarionet said he judge ye whether i speak from experience or imagination it was a christmas eve service in the second westcock church the church at second westcock was quaint and old-fashioned like the village over which it presided its shingles were gray with the beating of many winters its little square tower was surmounted by four spindling posts like the legs of a table turned heavenward its staring windows were adorned with curtains of yellow cotton its uneven and desolate churchyard strewn with graves and snowdrifts occupied a bleak hillside looking out across the bay to the lonely height of shepherdy mountain down the long slope below the church straggled the village half lost in the snow and whistled over by the winds of the bay of fundy second westcock was an outlying corner of the rector's expansive parish and a christmas eve service there was an event almost unparalleled to give a second westcock this service the rector had forsaken his prosperous congregation at westcock sackville and dorchester driving some eight or ten miles through the snows and solitude of the deep dorchester woods and because the choir at second westcock was not remarkable even for willingness much less for strength or skill he had brought with him his fifteen-year-old niece lou allison to swell the christmas praise with the notes of her clarionet the little church was lighted with oil lamps ranged along the white wall between the windows the poor bare chancel a red cloth covered kitchen table in a semicircle of paintless railing was flanked by two towering pulpits of white pine on either side the narrow carpetless aisle were rows of unpainted benches on the left were gathered solemnly the men of the congregation each looking straight ahead on the right were the women whispering and scanning each other's bonnets till the appearance of the rector from the little vestry room by the door should bring silence and reverent attention in front of the women's row stood the melodeon and the two benches behind it were occupied by the choir the male members of which sat blushingly self-conscious proud of their office but deeply abashed at the necessity of sitting among the women there was no attempt at christmas decoration for second westcott had never been awakened to the delicious excitements of the church greening at last the rector appeared in his voluminous white surplice he moved slowly up the aisle and mounted the winding steps of the right-hand pulpit and as he did so his five-year-old son forsaking his place by lou's side marched forward and seated himself resolutely on the pulpit steps he did not feel quite at home in second westcott church the sweet old carol while shepherds watch their flocks by night rose rather doubtfully from the little choir who looked and listened askance at the glittering clarionet into which lou was now blowing softly 
lou was afraid to make herself distinctly heard at first lest she should startle the singers but in the second verse the pure vibrant notes came out with confidence and then for two lines the song was little more than a duet between lou and the rector's vigorous baritone in the third verse however it all came right the choir felt and responded to the strong support and thrilling stimulus of the instrument and at length ceased to dread their own voices the naked little church was glorified with the sweep of triumphal song pulsating through it never before had such music been heard there men and women and children sang from their very souls and when the hymn was ended the whole congregation stood for some seconds as in a dream with quivering throats till the rector's calm voice repeating the opening words of the liturgy brought back their self-control in some measure thereafter every hymn and chant and carol was like an inspiration and lou's eyes sparkled with exultation when the service was over the people gathered round the stove by the door praising lou's clarionet and petting little ted who had by this time come down from the pulpit steps one old lady gave the child two or three brown sugar biscuits which she had brought in her pocket and a pair of red mittens which she had knitted for him as a christmas present turning to lou the old lady said i never heerd nothin like that trumpet o yourn miss i felt like it just drawed down to angels from heaven to sing with us to-night their voices was all swimmin in a smoke like right up in the hollow o the ceiling tain't a trumpet interrupted teddy shyly it's a clarinet. i got a trumpet at home to be sure replied the old lady indulgently but miss as i was a sayin that music o yourn would just soften the hardest hearts as ever was the rector had just come from the vestry room well wrapped up in his furs and was shaking hands and wishing every one a merry christmas while the sexton brought the horse to the door he overheard the old lady's last remark as she was bundling teddy up in a huge woolen muffler oh, it certainly did said he make the singing go magnificently to-night didn't it mrs tate but i wonder now what sort of an effect it would produce on a hard-hearted bear if such a creature should come out at us while we were going through dorchester woods the mild pleasantry was very delicately adapted to the rector's audience and the group about the stove smiled with a reverent air befitting the place they were in but the old lady exclaimed in haste my land sakes possum the bear just scared to death i wonder if it would frighten a bear thought lou to herself as they were getting snugly bundled into the warm deep pung as the low box sleigh with movable seats is called soon the crest of the hill was passed and the four-poster on the top of second westcott church sank out of sight for a mile or more the road led through half-cleared pasture lands where the black stumps stuck up so strangely through the drifts that teddy discovered bears on every hand he was not at all alarmed however for he was sure his father was a match for a thousand bears by and by the road entered the curious inverted dark of the dorchester woods where all the light seemed to come from the white snow under the trees rather than from the dark sky above them at this stage of the journey teddy retired beneath the buffalo robes and went to sleep in the bottom of the pung the horse jogged slowly along the somewhat heavy road the bells jingled drowsily amid the soft pushing whisper of the runners lou and the rector talked in quiet voices attuned to the solemn hush of the great forest what's that lou shivered up closer to the rector as she spoke and glanced nervously into the dark woods whence a sound had come he did not answer at once but seized the whip and tightened the reins as a signal to old jerry to move on faster the horse needed no signal but awoke into an eager trot which would have become a gallop had the rector permitted again came the sound this time a little nearer and still apparently just abreast of the pung but deep in the woods it was a bitter long wailing cry blended with a harshly grating undertone like the rasping of a saw what is it again asked lou her teeth chattering the rector let old jerry out into a gallop as he answered i'm afraid it's a panther what they call around here an indian devil but i don't think there is any real danger it is a ferocious beast but will probably give us a wide berth why won't it attack us asked lou 
oh it prefers solitary victims replied the rector it is ordinarily a cautious beast and does not understand the combination of man and horse and vehicle only on rare occasions has it been known to attack people driving and this one will probably keep well out of our sight however it's just as well to get beyond its neighbourhood as quickly as possible steady jerry old boy steady don't use yourself up too fast the rector kept the horse well in hand but in a short time it was plain that the panther was not avoiding the party the cries came nearer and nearer and lou's breath came quicker and quicker and the rector's teeth began to set themselves grimly while his brows gathered in anxious thought if it should come to a struggle what was there in the slave he was wondering that would serve as a weapon nothing absolutely nothing but his heavy pocket-knife a poor weapon thought he ruefully with which to fight a panther but he felt in his pocket with one hand and opened the knife and slipped it under the edge of the cushion beside him at this instant he caught sight of the panther bounding along through the low underbrush keeping parallel with the road and not forty yards away there it is came in a terrified whisper from lou's lips and just then teddy lifted his head from under the robes frightened at the speed and at the set look on his father's face he began to cry the panther heard him and turned at once toward the sleigh old jerry stretched himself out in a burst of extra speed while the rector grasped his poor knife fiercely and the panther came with a long leap right into the road not ten paces behind the flying sleigh teddy stared in amazement then cowered down in fresh terror as there came an ear-splitting screech wild and high and long from lou's clarionet lou had turned and over the back of the seat was blowing this peal of desperate defiance in the brute's very face the astonished animal shrank back in his tracks and sprang again into the underbrush lou turned to the rector with a flushed face of triumph and the rector exclaimed in a husky voice thank god but teddy between his sobs complained what you do that for lou lou jumped to the conclusion that her victory was complete and final but the rector kept jerry at his top speed and scrutinized the underwood apprehensively the panther appeared again in four or five minutes returning to the road and leaping along some forty or fifty feet behind the sleigh his pace was a very curious disjointed india rubber spring which rapidly closed up on the fugitives then round swung lou's long instrument again and at its piercing cry the animal again shrank back this time however he kept to the road and the moment lou paused for breath he resumed the chase save your breath child exclaimed the rector as lou again put the slender tube to her lips save your breath and let him have it ferociously when he begins to get too near the animal came within twenty or thirty feet again and then lou greeted him with an ear-splitting blast and he fell back again and again the tactics were repeated lou tried a thrilling cadenza it was too much for the brute's nerves he could not comprehend a girl with such a penetrating voice and he could not screw up his courage to a closer investigation of the marvel at last the animal seemed to resolve on a change of procedure plunging into the woods he made an effort to get ahead of the sleigh old jerry was showing signs of exhaustion but the rector roused him to an extra spurt and there just ahead was the opening of fillmore's settlement blow lou blow shouted the rector and as the panther made a dash to intercept the sleigh it found itself in too close proximity to the strange-voiced phenomenon in the pung and sprang backward with an angry snarl as lou's breath failed from her dry lips the sleigh dashed out into the open a dog bayed angrily from the nearest farmhouse and the panther stopped short on the edge of the wood the rector drove into the farmyard and old jerry stopped shivering as if he would fall between the shafts after the story had been told and jerry had been stabled and rubbed down the rector resumed his journey with a fresh horse having no fear that the panther would venture across the cleared lands three of the settlers started out forthwith and following the tracks in the new snow succeeded in shooting the beast after a chase of two or three hours the adventure supplied the countryside all that winter with a theme for conversation 
and about lou's clarionet there gathered a halo of romance that drew rousing congregations to the parish church where its music was to be heard every alternate sunday evening i should say remarked queerman that to experience and imagination you combine a most tenacious memory who would have dreamed that the shy teddy with his proclivity for the pulpit steps would have developed into the stranian that we see before us to this there was no reply then suddenly magnus said sam and sam began at once this is all about jake dimble's wooden leg said sam one evening in the early summer i won't say how many years ago jake dimble was driving the cows home from pasture at that time jake a stout youth of seventeen had no thought of such an appendage as a wooden leg indeed he had no place to put one had he possessed such a thing for his own vigorous legs of bone and muscle with which he had been born and with which he had grown up in entire content seemed likely to serve him for the rest of his natural life but that very evening amid the safe quiet and soft colours of the upland cow pasture fate was making ready a lesson for him in the possibilities of the unexpected in westmoreland county that summer bears were looked upon as a drug in the market the county indeed seemed to be suffering from an epidemic of bears but so far these woody pastures of second westcock surrounded by settlements had apparently escaped the contagion when therefore jake was startled by an angry growl coming from a swampy thicket on his right the thought of a bear did not immediately occur to him he saw that the cows were running ahead with a sudden alertness but he paused and gazed at the thicket wondering whether it would be wise for him to go and investigate the source of the sound while he hesitated the question was decided for him a large black bear burst forth from the bushes with a crash that carried a nameless terror into jake's very soul the beast looked so cruelly out of place so horribly out of place breaking in upon the beauty and security of the familiar scene jake had no weapon more formidable than the hazel switch he was carrying and the pocket-knife with which he was trimming off its branches after one long horrified look at the bear jake took to flight along the narrow cowpath jake was a notable runner in those days yet the bear gained upon him rapidly the cowpath was tortuous exceedingly and away from the path the ground was too rough for fast running at least jake found it so the bear did not seem to mind the irregularities jake envied the cows their fine head start he wished he was with them then as he heard the bear getting closer he almost wished he was one of them and then his foot caught in a root and he fell headlong as he fell a great wave of despair went over him and a thought flashed through his mind this is the end of me his sight was darkened for an instant as he rolled in the moss and twigs between two hillocks then turning upon his back he saw the bear already hanging over him and now a desperate courage came to his aid raising his heels high in the air he brought them down with violence in the brute's face the animal started back astonished at this novel method of defence when it advanced again to the attack jake met it desperately with his heels and all the time he kept up a lusty shouting such as he hoped would soon bring some one to the rescue for a few minutes strange to say jake's tactics were successful in keeping his foe at bay but presently the bear growing more angry or more hungry made a fiercer assault and succeeded in catching the lad's foot between his jaws the brave fellow sickened under the cruel grip of those crunching teeth but he kept up the fight with his free heel just as he was about fainting with pain and exhaustion some farmers who had heard the outcry arrived upon the scene and the bear hastily withdrew that night there was a bear hunt at second westcock but it brought no spoils bruin had made an effective disappearance as for jake his foot and the lower part of his leg were so dreadfully mangled that the leg had to be cut off just below the knee when the lad was entirely recovered being a handy fellow he made himself a new leg of white oak around the bottom of which to prevent wear he hammered a stout iron ring 
the years went by in their usual surreptitious fashion and brought few changes to second westcock one june evening ten years after that on which my story opened jake was driving the cows home as usual when once more as he passed the swampy thicket he heard that menacing growl jake looked about him as if in a dream there was the same dewy smell in the air mingled with the fragrance of sweet fern that he remembered so painfully and so well there was the same long yellow cloud over the black woods to the west there was the same dappled sky of amber and violet over his head as before he saw the cows breaking into a run in a moment there was the same dreadful crashing in the thicket was he dreaming he looked down in bewilderment and his eyes fell on the iron-shod end of his wooden leg that settled it evidently he was not dreaming and it was time for him to hurry home he broke into a run as rapid as his wooden leg would allow now long use and natural dexterity had made jake almost as active in the handling of this wooden leg as most men are with the limbs which nature gave them but with his original legs in their pristine vigor he had found himself no match for a bear what then could he expect in the present instance jake looked over his shoulder and beheld the bear hot on his tracks he could have sworn it was the same bear as of old he made up his mind to run no more but to save his breath for what he felt might be his last fight he gave a series of terrific yells which as he thought might pierce even to the corner grocery under the hill and threw himself flat on his back on a gentle hummock that might pass for a post of advantage jake was not hopeful but he was firm he thought it would be too much to expect to come off twice victorious from a scrape like this he eyed the bear sternly and it seemed to him as if the brute actually smiled on observing that its intended victim had not forgotten his ancient tactics jake concluded that the approaching contest was likely to be fatal to himself but he calculated on making it at least unpleasant for the bear the animal turned a little to one side and attacked his prostrate antagonist in the flank but jake whirled nimbly just in time and brought down his iron-shod heel on the brute snout the blow was a heavy one but that bear was not at all surprised if it was the bear of the previous encounter it doubtless argued that years had brought additional weight and strength to its opponent's understanding it was not to be daunted but instantly seized the wooden leg and its angry jaws jake's yells for help continued but the bear the moment it discovered that the limb on which it was chewing was of good white oak fell a prey to astonishment if not alarm it dropped the leg backed off a few paces sat down upon its haunches and gazed at this strange and inedible species of man jake realized at once the creature's bewilderment but the crisis was such a painful one that the humor of the situation failed to strike him after a few moments of contemplation the bear made a fresh attack it was hungry and perhaps thought some other portion of jake's body might prove more delicate eating than his leg jake however gave it no chance to try the next hole the bear got was upon the very end of the oaken member where the iron ring proved little to its taste it tried fiercely for another hold but jake in his desperate struggles endowed with the strength of his terror succeeded in foiling it in every attempt at length with the utmost force of his powerful thigh he drove the end of the leg right into the beast's open mouth inflicting a serious wound blood flowed freely from the animal's throat and presently after a moment of hesitation having probably concluded that the morsel was not savoury enough to justify any further struggle the bear moved sullenly away coughing and whining jake lay quite still till his vanquished antagonist had disappeared in the covert then he rose and wended his way homeward thinking to himself how much better his wooden leg had served him than an ordinary one could have done in a few minutes he was met by some of his fellow townsmen who were hastening to find out the cause of all the noise to them jake related the adventure with great elation adding as he concluded you see now how everything turns out for the best 
if i hadn't lost that ere leg o' mine this night ten year ago i'd have maybe lost my head this very evening in spite of jake dimble's reputation for truthfulness his story was not believed in the village of second westcock it was voted altogether too improbable from whatever side it was looked at in fact so profoundly incredulous were his fellow villagers that jake could not even organize a bear hunt some ten days later however his veracity received ample confirmation a man out looking for strayed cattle in the woods not more than a couple of miles from jake's pasture found a large bear lying dead in a cedar swamp examining the body curiously to find the cause of death he was puzzled till he recalled jake's story then he looked at the dead brute's throat the mystery was solved and the community was once for all convinced of the fighting qualities of the wooden leg well, that's a good story said magnus in a vague way it reminds me of one which is as unlike it as anything could well be mine is a tropical tale let the o m enter it as peril among the pearls i got it at first hand when i was in halifax last autumn in the tiny office of the Cunarder inn the air was thick with smoke the white egg-shaped stove contained a fire though september was yet young for a raw night fog had rolled in over halifax making the display of bright coals no less comforting than cheerful from the adjacent wharves came the soft washing and whispering of the tide with an occasional rattle of oars as a boat came to land from one of the many ships the density of the atmosphere in the office was chiefly due to al johnson the diver who when he was not talking diving eating or sleeping was sure to be puffing at his pipe we had talked little but now i resolved to turn off the smoke flowing from johnson's pipe by getting him to tell us a story he could never tell a story and keep his pipe lit at the same time johnson was a college-bred man whom a love of adventure had lured into deep-sea diving he and his partner were at this time engaged in recovering the cargo of a steamer ulrich sunk near the entrance to halifax harbour i asked johnson do you remember promising me a yarn about an adventure you had in the pearl fisheries which adventure and what pearl fisheries johnson asked i fished in tonnevelly and in the sulu waters off the borneo coast and also in the torres strait and wheresoever it was there seemed to be pretty nearly always some excitement going oh said i whichever you like to give us i think what you spoke of was an adventure in the torres strait no said johnson i think i'll give you a little yarn about a tussle i had with a turtle in the sulu waters i fancy there isn't much that grows but you'll find it somewhere in borneo and the water there is just as full of life as the land sharks i queried oh worse than sharks replied johnson there's a big squid that will squirt the water black as ink and just then perhaps something comes along and grabs you when you can't defend yourself and there's the devil fish own cousin to the squid and the meanest enemy you'll want to run across anywhere and there's a tremendous giant of a shellfish a kind of scalloped clam that lies with its huge shells wide open but half hidden in the long weeds and sea mosses if you put your foot into that trap snap it closes on you and you're fast that clam is a good deal stronger than you are and if you have not a hatchet or something to smash the shell with you are likely to stay there of course your partner in the boat up aloft would soon know something was wrong finding that he couldn't haul you up then he would go down after you and chop you loose perhaps but meanwhile it would be far from nice especially if a shark came along if another clam does not nab him for one of these big clams has been known to catch even a shark many natives thereabouts do a lot of diving on their own account and of course don't indulge in diving suits i can tell you they are very careful not to fall afoul of these clam shells for when they do they're drowned before they can get clear you can hardly blame the clam or whatever it is said i it must be rather a shock to its nerves when it feels a big foot thrust down right upon its stomach no assented johnson you can't blame the clam but besides the clam there is a big turtle that is a most officious creature with a beak that will almost cut railroad iron 
it is forever poking that beak into whatever it thinks it doesn't know all about and you cannot scare it as you can a shark you have simply got to kill it before it will acknowledge itself beaten these same turtles however at the top of the water or on dry land would in most cases prove as timid as rabbits and then as you say there are the sharks all kinds big and little forever hungry but not half so courageous as they get the credit of being i suppose i interrupted you always carried a weapon of some sort well rather said johnson for my own part i took a great fancy to the ironwood stakes that the natives always use but they don't seem to me quite the thing for smashing those big shells with supposing a fellow should happen to put his foot into one so i made myself a stake with a steel top which answered every purpose more than one big shark have i settled with that handspike of mine and once i found to my great advantage that it was just the thing to break up a shell with ha ha laughed best who had been listening rather inattentively here too so you put your foot in it did you yes i did said johnson and that is just what i'm going to tell you about i was working that season with a good partner a likely young fellow hailing from auckland he tended the line and the pump to my complete satisfaction i've never had a better tender also i was teaching him to dive and he took to it like a loon his name was larry scott and if he had lived he would have made a record he was killed about a year after the time i'm telling you of in a row down in new orleans but we won't stop to talk about that now as i was saying larry and i pulled together pretty well from the start and we were so lucky with our fishing that the fellows in the other boats began to get jealous and unpleasant you must know that all kinds go to the pearl fisheries and the worst kinds have rather the best of it in point of numbers we were ready enough to fight but we liked best to go our own way peaceably so when some of the other lads got quarrelsome we just smiled hoisted our sail and looked up a new ground for ourselves some little distance from the rest of the fleet luck being on our side just then we chanced upon one of the finest beds in the whole neighbourhood one morning as i was poking about among the seaweed and stuff i came across a fine-looking bunch of pearl shells i made a grab at them but they were firmly rooted and refused to come away i laid down my handspike took hold of the cluster with both hands and shifted my foothold so as to get a good chance to pull up came the bunch of shells at the first wrench much more readily than i had expected to recover myself i took a step backward down went my foot into a crevice slumped into something soft and snap my leg was fast in the grip that almost made me yell there in the little prison of my helmet well as you may imagine just as soon as i recovered from the start this gave me i reached out for my handspike to knock that clamshell into flinders but a cold shiver went over me as i found i could not reach the weapon as i laid it down it had slipped a little off to one side and there it rested about a foot out of my reach reclining on one of those twisted conch shells such as the farmers use for dinner horns how i jerked on my leg trying to pull it out of the trap that however only hurt the leg all the satisfaction i could get was in the thought that my foot with its big twenty-pound rubber and lead boot must be making the clam's internal affairs rather uncomfortable after i had pretty well tired myself out stretching and tugging on my leg and struggling to reach the handspike i paused to recover my wind and consider the situation it was not very deep water i was working in and there was any amount of light you have no sort of idea until you have been there yourself what a queer world it is down where the pearl oyster grows the seaweeds were all sorts of colours or rather i should say they were all sorts of reds and yellows and greens the rest of the colours of the rainbow you might find in the shells which lay around underfoot or went crawling among the weeds and away overhead darted and flashed the queerest looking fish like birds in a yellow sky there were lots of big anemones too waving stretching and curling their many-coloured tentacles i saw everything with extraordinary vividness about that time as i know by the clear way i recollect it now but you may be sure i wasn't thinking much just then about the beauties of nature 
i was trying to think of some way of getting assistance from larry at length i concluded i had better give him the signal to haul me up finding that i was stuck he would i reasoned hoist the anchor and then pull the boat along to the place of my captivity then he could easily send me down a hatchet wherewith to chop my way to freedom just as i had come to this resolve a black shadow passed over my head and i looked up quickly it was a big turtle i didn't like this i can tell you but i kept pretty still hoping the newcomer would not notice me he paddled along very slowly with his queer little head stuck far out and presently he noticed my air tube it seemed to strike him as decidedly queer my blood fairly turned to ice in my veins as i saw him paddle up and take hold of it in a gingerly fashion with his beak luckily he didn't seem to think it would be good to eat but i knew that if he should bite it i would be a dead man in about a minute drowned inside my helmet like a rat in a hole it is in an emergency like this that a man learns to know what real terror is in my desperation i stooped down and tore with both hands at the shells and weeds for something i might hurl at the turtle thinking thus perhaps to distract his attention from my air tube but what do you suppose happened why i succeeded in pulling up a great lump of shells and stones all bedded together the mass was fully two feet long my heart gave a leap of exultation for i knew at once just what to do with the instrument thus providentially placed in my hands instead of trying to hurl it at the turtle i reached out with it and managed to scrape that precious handspike within grasp as i gathered it once more into my grip i straightened up and was a man again just at this juncture the turtle decided to take a hand in i had given the signal to be hauled up at the very moment when i got hold of that lump of stones and now i could feel larry tugging energetically on the rope the turtle left off fooling with the tube and paddling down to see what was making such a commotion in the water he tackled me at once as it happened however he took hold of the big copper nut on the top of the headpiece and that was too tough a morsel even for his beak so that all he could do was to shake me a bit with him at my head and the clam on my leg and larry jerking on my waistband you may imagine i could hardly call my soul my own however i began jabbing my handspike for all i was worth into the unprotected parts of the turtle's body feeling around for some vital spot which is a thing mighty hard to find in a turtle in a moment the water was red with blood but that made no great difference to me and for a while it didn't seem to make much difference to the turtle either all i could do was to keep on jabbing as close to the neck as i could and between the front flippers and the turtle kept on chewing at the copper joint i believe it was the clam that helped me most effectually in that struggle you see that grip on my leg kept me as steady as a rock if it hadn't been for that the turtle would have had me off my feet and end over end in no time and would probably have soon got the best of me as it was after a few moments of this desperate stabbing with the handspike i managed to kill my assailant but even in death that iron beak of his maintained its hold on the copper nut of my helmet having no means of cutting the brute's head off i turned my attention to the big clam and with the steel point of my handspike i soon released my foot then larry hauled me up he told me afterward he never in all his life got such a start as when that great turtle came to the surface hanging on to the top of my helmet the creature was so heavy he could not haul it and me together into the boat so he slashed the head off with a hatchet and then lifted me aboard beyond a black and blue leg i was not much the worse for that adventure but i was so used up with excitement of it all that i wouldn't go down for any more pearls that day we took a day off larry and i and indulged in a little run ashore you had earned it said i now queerman said sam as your turn comes round again give us something less lugubrious than your last be light be cheerful it seems to me that i remember replied queerman a merry little adventure that befell me some years ago if it is not hilarious enough to suit you sam you can stop me in the middle of it while you fellows were fishing this afternoon i was reading mr gummer's handbook of poetics 
without by any means endorsing all that he says i was struck by many imaginative passages in one place he says something dimly personal stood behind the flash of lightning the roaring of the wind that is suggestive i'll tell you a case in point from my own experience in newfoundland let me call the story the dogs of the drift end of chapter four part one